and welcome to Trafalgar Square here in the heart of London for the cinematic event of the century. I'm Alex Zane. And I'm Edith Borman, and together we shall guide you through this historic event, which is the culmination for a lot of people of a 10-year journey. What are we talking about? Well, just in case you haven't guessed, this should leave you in no doubt. I'm from Sweden. I'm from Belgium. Newcastle in Australia. Melbourne. Vancouver, Canada. New York. New York. Minnesota. Denmark. And Vancouver, Canada. I'm here because I love Harry Potter and it's like my entire life. I'm here for this. It's just everything. It's like a once in a lifetime event. I've been a fan for 10 years. I'm still counting. I've never done this before and it was the last chance to see everyone. It's, it's kind of amazing that something has gone on for 10 years and everyone is still here camping out in the rain. I just want to see the people who have made my life and my childhood and everything complete. It's kind of like represents our generation. I could not come. <laughs> Deathly Hallows is underwhelming. The book and its two-part film adaptation, they each offer too little too late, and they each encapsulate the issues the previous entries had spent a decade glossing over. Understandably, they didn't want to disgust mainstream audiences with a single film over four hours long, but why were the 200,000 words of Hallows considered less cuttable than the comparably large word counts of Goblet, Phoenix, and Half-Blood? That's not to say word count accurately translates to runtime, but is the plot of Hallows actually justifiably uncuttable compared to those three others, none of which breached two and a half hours of runtime, let alone the over four hours Hallows part one and two end up lasting when added together. How do you start, where do you start with the words of, of J.K. Rowling to, to turn them into the right words of telling the story for screen? I start where all the fans do is, you know, I read the book and try to just read the book and experiencing it, experience it, and then, and then I try to think of the movie I want to see, and, and I don't think it's any really different than most fans. I mean, it's, a, and I just have to sort of try to make it happen. Is it hard to condense it? Oh yeah, because as all the fans know, the the the, the brilliance of Joe's work is in the details, and it's hard to to maintain all those details when you're. We only have two and a half hours. The lucrative enticement of splitting the franchise's climax into two distinctly sellable products, filmed simultaneously but released a year apart, sure is suspicious, in particular regards to their contradictory cutting of enough of this supposedly uncuttable book that such a justification no longer seems truthful. It was a really tricky decision to, you know, take to make two movies out of the book, and it, it sort of transpired really because Steve had started the adaptation process while we were making Harper Prince really struggled to contain everything in one script. The final four-hour film suggests it was not the book they found so uncuttable, but the screenplay, which is of the absent-minded infidelity we have come to expect from Steve Clovis, additionally hindered by having to make up for the shortcomings of the previous instalments. Were there any things in this film that you felt you wanted to tie in or loose ends that you wanted to close up from the previous books that may have been left out due to time or something like that? Wow, that's a really good question because well, you know, there are things that I had that gave me, fit, drove me crazy, which was things like the mirror, the, 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 the piece of the mirror, which was, you know, something that, you know, I had to sort of find a way to introduce in, in, in the beginning of this one. Um, there's always things like that. I mean, I, I'm trying to think. It's, Seven books for seven school years adapted into a total of eight films, ironically reminiscent of Voldemort unintentionally splitting his soul eight ways, and therefore, although it is almost entirely unelaborated, diminishing the strength of his immortality. Rowling and her deeply flawed books remain at the heart of it all, and contrary to her seemingly hands-off approach to the first six films, she joined Hallows as an official credited producer. As one of her first and perhaps most destructive acts of denial that her contributions to Harry Potter ever ended. I wonder, given the mess Hallows ended up making of its adaptation, how much blood was on her hands. Once I knew you were up and running and it was fine. It was a relief to say, right, there are the films and I'm over here with the books and that's fine. And I trust these people and I did and I do. Uh, and that's wonderful. And you know, yeah. I think, and I have to say that it was inevitably you had to depart from the strict storyline of the books. The books are simply too long to make yeah. into very faithful films. 
And um, I can think of many places where it's worked just beautifully. And some things are just more filmic and some things are more inherently novelistic. So I, I, w I was always accepting of that. It didn't have to be a word-for-word -word transcription of my no, world. No. Although some fans are that. Yes, scary. I mean, I do, I do, I do, I do not, think that, 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 that they kind of... No, you're not, which is wonderful. But I do, I do sometimes think that, you know, if we did make a six-hour Harry Potter film, there would be... There would be an audience there would, for There would it. be an audience, And yeah. they would be, still be complaining that there were things that were wrong yeah. and they would want the director's cut. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so <laughs> let, let's not even go down that route. These are dark times, there is no denying. Part one starts with an extreme close-up of Bill Nighy giving a speech as Rufus Scrimshaw, the new Minister for Magic film only watchers are seeing for the first time and will only see on one more occasion before the announcement of his off-screen death. He is a nothing character who may as well have still been Cornelius Fudge. Fudge isn't much of a character himself, but at least he's already familiar as the Minister. In the books, after Scrimjaw replaces Fudge at the start of Half-Blood, he more proactively prepares for the upcoming war, but fails to recruit the independent efforts of the Order because Dumbledore disagrees with his past methods, and Harry, besides his loyalty to Dumbledore, doesn't want to become the Ministry's poster boy. Harry and Scrimjaw's interactions never end on friendly terms, but Scrimjaw isn't evil, and his his opinion that Dumbledore and the Chosen One should be working with the Ministry instead of keeping their secrets is reasonable. It would be more reasonable, however, if the Ministry wasn't so inept and susceptible to corruption. But I can't see how such a public organisation can avoid corruption when Dark Wizards have such tools as the Imperius Curse at their disposal. It's surprising the espionage efforts of the Order even get as far as they do, which with their few members is not very far at all, when the opposition are willing to use such advantageous magic. In fact, the trio only succeed in their Horcrux hunting by eventually using some of said dark magic themselves. The book's first chapter, and the film's first post-title card scene, features Voldy and his high table of Death Eaters gathering at Malfoy Manor to discuss their intel on the date and time of Harry's escort out of Privet Drive, which becomes known as the Battle of the Seven Potters because of the Order's insane plan to disguise six people as Harry decoys. Wow, we're identical! The source of this plan, the film justifiably skims over explaining during The Prince's Tale, is the portrait of Dumbledore in the Headmaster's office, who told Snape to confront Mundungus to propose the plan to the Order, and, after they for some reason decided this plan from their least trustworthy member was a good one, to tell Voddy the plan to further cement his loyalty and thereby become Headmaster of Hogwarts, keeping contact with Dumbledore's portrait and saving the students from the Carrows, who might otherwise have given them all an even worse time than the bad time they would go on to give them anyway. They like punishment, the Carrows. Of the trio's personal preparations for the journey they'll be taking, we see Hermione wiping herself from her parents' memories. The book specifies she sends them to Australia, but if the Death Eaters could connect them to her and go after them, I'm not sure why another country would be beyond their limits. Family is also on Ron's mind during their camping, which the film briefly sets up with a shot of him standing facing away from the bustling burrow. In the lead up to the wedding in the book, he explains the ghoul in the attic will give the hopefully uninvestigated excuse for his Hogwarts absence. But frankly, the family of the guy Harry Potter has been best friends with since their first year should be a bunch of prime suspects regardless. At least enough for the Death Eaters who end up investigating the burrow to actually confirm Ron's status. Harry watches the Dursleys depart Privet Drive and looks at the mirror shard the film hasn't bothered to establish that in the book he rediscovers whilst packing the essentials for his quest. A deleted scene featuring an unconvincing fat suit does adapt a little of Harry's reconciliation with Dudley before they're escorted by some Order members to operate to a safe house at the same time Harry is due to leave. Hermione's parents couldn't be offered the same protection, apparently, but then Dumbledore ensured only the trio would know for sure what they were getting up to and just how closely a associated Ron and Hermione would be. The Seven Potters convoy is ambushed so soon after leaving Privet Drive, however, that I can't see how the Dursleys wouldn't have been checked and murdered on their way out. Harry could have been disguised as anyone to try and leave the neighbourhood undetected, the Death Eaters certainly seem to have enough numbers to cover a perimeter to see anyone visibly leaving, and why would they suddenly have the morality to let anyone peacefully pass their perimeter, whether they're confirmed to be Harry or related to Harry or not? For the sake of sanity, accepting they are completely unable to break the transportation law, forbidding the use of port keys and apparition in and out of Privet Drive, there's still better options than disguising a bunch of people as Harry and darting off towards different port keys, or, as the film presents it, straight towards the burrow.
The obvious option is to apparate the second they leave Privet Drive or leave the area apparition is restricted. The underage Trace may be able to trace Harry, but his presence can be masked by apparating with adults, the Death Eaters don't yet have complete control of the Ministry, and it doesn't matter if they do trace where he apparates, as long as he makes it into another protected area or to one of the poor keys they want to use to conceal the safe houses. If he wasn't staying at a place, a public wedding would soon occur, and was instead at a place hidden by a Fidelius charm, such a measure wouldn't be necessary. As evident by the trio staying undetected at Grimmauld Place, despite Death Eaters constantly waiting outside. Other options could be disguising as some muggles and driving out as easily as the Dursleys seem to have been able to, walking or broomstick flying out under Harry's or any number of other invisibility cloaks, or just flying out in plain sight on his extremely fast broomstick at such speeds the Death Eaters can't keep up. It's not like broomsticks run out of energy. The only real positive of the Seven Potters plan is it creates six additional targets only Vordy can kill, because Vordy wants to kill Harry himself. But that's only really relevant if they're expecting an ambush, which the Order is is not, and relies on Voldy being unable to fly around and pick off all seven Harrys, which certainly seems within reason for how much his dark magic is supposed to be feared. It sure is lucky so few of the Order acquire injuries, none of them get captured, and only their leader dies, but the most insane luck is that despite Hedwig defending him in the film and his use of Expelliarmus in the book revealing the real Harry, and Voldy immediately pursuing and fighting the real Harry, he still survives. When Voldy flies past in a cloud of smoke and aims to kill, Harry's wand magnetically pulls his arm up to align with Voldy's and casts a spell of its own volition that defends him with as much success as the Priori Incantatum phenomenon we know from the end of Goblet, a phenomenon that should by all accounts be impossible in these circumstances, because it only occurs between twin wands and at the Malfoy Manor meeting, Voldy took the precaution of checking that Lucius's wand isn't a twin of Harry's and uses it instead of his own. The arse pull of an explanation for Harry's wand still blocking Voldy's is later speculated on by Dumbledore in Limbo. He concludes that, I believe that your wand imbibed some of the power and qualities of Voldemort's wand that night, which is to say it contained a little of Voldemort himself, so your wand recognised him when he pursued you, recognised a man who was both kin and mortal enemy, and it regurgitated some of his own magic against him, magic much more powerful than anything Lucius's wand had ever performed. Your wand now contained the power of your enormous courage and Voldemort's own deadly skill. What chance did that poor stick of Lucius Malfoy stand? Its remarkable effects were directed only at Voldemort, who had tampered so ill-advisedly with the deepest laws of magic. Only towards him was that wand abnormally powerful, otherwise it was a wand like any other. If it wasn't for this deus ex machina, Voldy would have killed Harry during the ambush Dumbledore set in motion. There was always that risk, but Dumbledore couldn't have known just how close it would be to coming true, because why would he expect Harry to fight back with as much stupidity as using the Expelliarmus spell he's famous enough for to be identified by? Mad Eye's dead. His death is more passed over in the film, but Moody's presence isn't substantial enough in the books to satisfy the effect his death is meant to have there either, that being the loss of his battle-hardened veteran leadership so soon after losing Dumbledore. If Dumbledore's death didn't cement it enough before, now it really is all on Harry. Not that Dumbledore should have expected or orchestrated it to all be on Harry. As Molly points out by saying, if Dumbledore needed something done, he had the whole order at his command. The first of our questioning of Dumbledore comes in the form of Harry spending almost the entirety of Chapter 2, titled In Memoriam, reading newspaper articles about the late headmaster. One article, written by his school friend Alphias Doge, which includes an outline of the tragedies of the Dumbledore family, and another article interviewing Rita Skeeter about her new biography, The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore. In the film, this newspaper and these articles are seen briefly, and during the wedding, Harry sits in on Alphias Doge and Auntie Muriel's disagreements about Dumbledore past. As far as the film is concerned, acquiring the necessary seeds of discontent about how little information Dumbledore really divulged about himself or the Horcrux plan. Skeeter's biography and the controversies it perhaps unfairly and with a biased dramatisation unveils is of much less concern to Harry's faith in the Horcrux quest throughout the film than in the book. On the whole though, Dumbledore in the films has all along had bigger issues with inconsistent and sometimes downright incorrect portrayals of his personality. Welcome, welcome to another year at Hogwarts. There's a grace and there's a dignity and there's a weight there. Um, and Michael's very mischievous in his own sort of special way. Something of the slight changes that we wanted to do is that we wanted to recover one element of the Dumbledore of the books that is a certain 
rather than a regalness, a certain funkiness. He could seem a little shabby and a little distracted, but actually he's completely in control of everything. And that's something that I think that Michael brought onto the table in a, in a, in a really beautiful. Dumbledore is who Dumbledore is by the very nature of what Joe Rowling wrote. Wise, eccentric, with a twinkle in his eye. He doesn't replace Richard. He is doing Michael Gamblin's Harry thing. Potter! Harry! I protest! Harry! Curiosity is not a sin, Harry, but you should exercise caution. Harry! <laughs> no! No! <laughs> I never liked these curtains. Based on Goblet, Harry should be under no impression the headmaster cares about him or is deserving of the amount of respect that's meant to make the late reveal of his past controversies so shocking. This portrayal then bleeds into and impacts Phoenix, where Harry is supposed to feel estranged by Dumbledore's sudden coldness and distance. In Half-Blood, the character and Gambon's portrayal have steadied their balance enough to find the remorseful exhaustion with which Dumbledore tearfully labours through what he knows to be the end of his life. Not setting up enough of the needlessly secretive manipulation relations that complicate Harry's Horcrux quest, but at least setting the melancholic stage for the fates awaiting him and everyone else. The impact of his death is, however, almost entirely diminished by Rowling's need to wobble on the crutch of his what seems to be all but physically functional portrait replica, who steals Snape's agency by continuing to come up with and command his performance of several major actions that lead to Voddy's unlikely defeat. To kill the other Horcruxes, we have to find them. Where are they? When the trio finally find a moment to sneak in a chat at the burrow, Ron and Hermione reaffirm their investment in the Horcrux quest, and Hermione reveals the Horcrux book she accioed out of the window of the headmaster's office before the end of their sixth year. To be able to shout something as vague as Accio Horcrux books, and have the desired object fly from a limitless distance towards you, perhaps isn't so convenient as Dumbledore leaving the book where such a method could retrieve it. As repulsive as Hermione might find its depraved contents, the book does prove to be a useful read. Useful enough that we must question why Dumbledore never got around to giving it to Harry, or even telling him about its removal from the library's restricted section. Really, it just seems like Rowling felt it necessary to more explicitly fill in some of the glaring Horcrux holes Dumbledore left the trio and the reader to loosely glue a Horcrux hunt together with. As she has done all series, and more prevalently in the films, Hermione continues to carry much of the intellectual and magical weight of their journey, quite literally in the wedding's case, after the abrupt ending of which she reveals to have been carrying a magically enlarged bag containing each of their essentials she had packed in advance just in case they had to make a quick getaway. Ah, uh, that'll be the books. Notable film-excluded turmoils Harry goes through early on in their quest include rummaging through Sirius's childhood bedroom and finding a letter about him from Lily, for which the second sheet is missing, and for the first time since Prisoner, finding himself unable to cast a Patronus when encountering Dementors in a town he was foraging for food. The cause of this Patronus impotence is at least partially the locket Horcrux Harry for some reason decided to take with him after the trio for some reason deemed it necessary for one of them to always be wearing it to keep it safe. How unlucky it is that antagonists so happen to be patrolling the town Harry entered, and why the trio ever have enough of a food problem to starve when magic can duplicate already existing food are other contrivances the book seems almost to taunt us with. Accustomed to three house-elf-cooked Hogwarts feasts or three molly-cooked meals a day, Ron copes particularly badly compared to the hunger-experienced Harry and the muggle-born Hermione, the straw that breaks the camel's back being when Harry and Hermione finally have an epiphany. In the Chamber of Secrets, you stab the basilisk with the sword of Gryffindor. Its blade is impregnated with basilisk venom. Somewhat out of nowhere in the film. Oh my god! But in the book, eavesdropping on a neighbouring camp of outcasts talking about the Sword of Gryffindor, which, between Dumbledore leaving it to Harry in his will, and Ginny, Neville and Luna trying to steal it from Hogwarts, remains missing. I want to go to Godric's Hollow. 
After another long while of nothing, Harry and Hermione concede they must risk a venture to Godric's Hollow, wherein Dumbledore perhaps hid the sword they know will destroy the locket. Unlike the film, they go disguised by Polyjuice in the book, and after the Batilda backshot disguised Nagini sounds the alarm, they barely get away before Voldy swoops in. They couldn't apparate immediately because Nagini separated them in the house, and they could only escape by apparition at all because Voldy conveniently forwent preventing apparition to and from the house and didn't apparate there himself. A complete failure, this Christmas exertion results in Harry's Voldemort repellent wand irreparably breaking and Voldy using a photo of Grindelwald he saw to track down the Elder Wand. How did he find us? Look at this. It doesn't just turn off lights. I don't know how it works. Another in the long line of conveniences that is this series is Dumbledore's Deluminator, previously known as and aptly changed from the name The Put Outer, guiding Ron back to Harry and Hermione's campsite. Because of course Dumbledore expected Ron to leave the quest enough to gift him a device that fulfills such a specific purpose. Wicked. Even though most of the reason he left was because of the Horcrux's corruption of the fact they had no leads to go on, and the Deluminator would only activate if and when his name is spoken by the person his heart wants to return to. And what exactly did I say, may I ask? My name. Just my name. On a nightly lookout, Harry follows a corporeal Doe Patronus through the forest until arriving at a frozen pond, at the bottom of which he can see lies the sword. The source of this Doe Patronus and the person who put the sword in the pond was Snape, acting of course on portrait Dumbledore's orders. The vague explanation for putting the sword in the pond instead of walking up to the trio's tent, handing it to them and revealing his role in everything, is that the sword needs to be acquired under valorous conditions. Another of Snape's Patronuses also leads Ron to the pond, where he is fortunate enough to arrive and pull Harry out before the locket he decided to dive in wearing could drown him. The film further foregoes establishing the variables with which Snape is even able to find them in the forest in the first place. At Grimald Place in the book, Hermione takes down Phineas Nigella's Black's portrait and stashes it in her magically enlarged bag for fear Snape will use the twin portrait in the headmaster's office to spy on them. During their camping, they then pull out the portrait to consult Phineas about how Ginny and Co tried to steal the sword and the repercussions of doing so, keeping one of their what should still be inaccessible campsites a secret by casting the spell Obscuro to blindfold him, because I guess the contents of these sentient painting dimensions can be altered willy-nilly. A problematic line for Rowling to cross for such an ambiguous, ubiquitous, and in Hallow's case influential piece of magic. Nonetheless, Phineas still overhears enough from within Hermione's bag to relay their location to Snape and Dumbledore in the headmaster's office, it becoming more and more clear how much more productive it would have been for the trio to instead carry around a copy of Dumbledore's portrait. Since Ron fished both Harry and the sword out of the pond, Rowling wants the trio to destroy at least a Horcrux each, and the locket affected him the most. It is he who prepares to swing the sword. Untested in their previous feeble attacks on a locket, Harry first speaks parcel tongue to pop it open. Perhaps the encounter with Nagini in Godric's Hollow brought this possibility to his attention, but why would the locket need a system by which Voddy can ask it to open if all that does is make it vulnerable to destruction, and is opening it even necessary for the sword to destroy it? but what happens can still barely be considered a defence, a visual and auditory manifestation of his attacker's worst fears emerging in an explosion of black smoke that pushes them backwards and proceeds only to taunt them to destroy it faster. Even if alone, would Ron or anyone else courageous enough to reach this point curl up into a ball on the ground or walk off and leave the Horcrux to its business? I think not. The nightmare the Horcrux pulls from Ron's mind, too contemporary and superficial to satisfy him overcoming the insecurity that have tormented him the whole series, sidelining almost everything to do with his character to instead put an end to the vague romantic possibilities between Harry and Hermione we should already be convinced of the unlikelihood of. The reunited trio go over to Xenophilius Lovegood's house and learn about the story of the Three Hallows before Luna's imprisonment forces Zeno to betray them and they apparate away. In the film, they're unfortunate enough to apparate right into the middle of a group of snatchers, who are ruffians the Death Eaters Ministry have hired to capture undesirable wizards. Even though Harry is undesirable number one, they don't instantly recognise him or his two who should also be well-known accomplices. The trio display equal stupidity in deciding they would rather run aimless 
aimlessly through the woods, then immediately huddle back together to apparate away to what will most likely be actual safety, giving us one of the worst shot and least creative action sequences in the franchise, and one of the dumbest decisions the trio collectively or individually made. Though in the book, they don't apparate into a pack of snatchers, whose presence can only be excused by their tracking of magical traces left behind by one of the trio's previous campsites, the decision that a little while later incites their capture exhibits perhaps even higher degrees of idiocy and contrivance than the film. When Ron returned, he called Harry and Hermione up on the things he'd learned, such as the secret radio show run by some of their Hogwarts friends that announces the newest developments in the Resistance, and more crucially, the jinx on saying Voldemort that had been in place since the Ministry first fell to the Death Eaters. This jinx is what led some Death Eaters straight to the trio the minute they sat down at a random cafe in London. The trio unknowingly avoided the jinx throughout their camping because they stopped saying Voldemort altogether after Ron expressed annoyance and interrupted them whenever they tried, and the habit persisted past Ron's departure when Harry and Hermione were barely conversing anyway. Where the contrivance arises is when Harry, after Ron has informed them of this jinx and they escaped Lovegood's house and settled down at another campsite, idiotically blurts out Voldemort after the radio show announces he's abroad. Neither Ron or Hermione can interrupt him in time, or attempt to interrupt him by force. The habit of not saying Voldemort that was previously formed by Ron's successful interruptions, apparently failing him at this point, Harry should be more hesitant than ever to say Voldemort. The only thing that could remotely justify this stupidity is Harry deliriously blurting it out during a particularly vivid vision of Voldy looking for the Elder Wand abroad, not blurting it out in shock of his conscious realisation of this. If getting found and captured at one of their hidden campsites was too hard to write, Rowling should have just had them get captured at Lovegood's house. Whilst Harry's visions tell him Voldy is exploring a faraway tower where Grindelwald dwells, he and Ron are imprisoned with Luna, Ollivander, and Dean, whilst Bellatrix interrogates Hermione and Griphook about the sword. In desperation, Harry asks the face he's occasionally seen staring back at him in the mirror for help, and the face that turns out to be Aberforth sends Dobby to use his house elf magic to break them out. Ah! Dobby? When Dobby arrives precisely in front of them in the Malfoy Manor dungeon, which he has reasons to know about from his time as the Malfoy slave, Harry and Ron learn he and all other house elves can of course bypass the apparition restriction that was preventing them from escaping on their own, and should have prevented them from escaping from several other locations. Could you take us with you? Of course, uh, I'm an elf. Looks to me. Based off Ron's instructions, Dobby somehow locates and takes Luna, Ollivander, and Dean to what is to him the unfamiliar location we meet back up with them later at Shell Cottage, which is possible because the cottage conveniently isn't protected by Fidelia's charm until after Bill and the rest of the Weasleys have to go into hiding after Ron is discovered to be helping Harry. Not that it would matter if the cottage was already protected by Fidelia's charm, because house elves could just gain the power of bypassing those as well. Harry and Ron remain at Malfoy Manor to rescue Hermione and manage to escape the dungeon after Pettigrew comes down to investigate the noise of Dobby apparating and unlocks it. Pettigrew finds his wand wrestled out of his hand and strangles Harry until a split second of hesitation in which he stops strangling Harry causes his magical hand to strangle and kill himself, in spite of Harry and Ron's efforts to stop it. This is supposed to be one of Voldy's many cruelties to his followers, burdening the rat who brought him back to life with a hand that will kill him the moment he is disloyal, though I don't see how not killing the one one person Voldy has adamantly expressed a desire to kill himself is disloyal. As always, the nuance of whatever a piece of magic is intended to create or cause is at the whims of whatever narrative bead Rowling needs to make happen. At least in the book, Pettigrew's death signifies an actual end to his character, and shows Harry and Ron still haven't lost enough humanity to stand and watch whilst it happens. On the contrary, the film turns this rather serious moment into a comedic beat in which Dobby fires a nondescript spell from behind his back, and he groans and falls face first into the floor of the dungeon, either stunned unconscious or outright killed and never to be seen or heard from again. Uh... <laughs> 
With Dobby's continued help, they disarm everyone in the main hall, including Harry wrestling Draco's wand out of his hands and wielding three wands to the questionable effect of blasting Greyback with three times the power, similar to how the trio all blasted Snape in the Shrieking Shack during Prisoner. If casting a spell with multiple wands multiplies that spell's power, or even just casts multiple separate instances of the same spell, why aren't more wizards going around dual wielding wands or wrapping them together in a sort of Christmas cracker of explosive magic? Magical power. Whilst in the film, everyone pauses to look up at Dobby unscrewing a chandelier to fall on top of Bellatrix and her hostage Hermione, in the book we revisit the contrived tension we're familiar with from Godric's Hollow of the race against the time it takes Vardy to get there. No such time for Dobby to give the little character finalising speech the film uses in attempt to make up for him dying after barely 10 collective minutes of screen time across the franchise. The film was however correct to use his death as the end point of its first part, as the script's original idea of ending the first part on a cliffhanger of the trio entering Malfoy Manor, and Dobby instead dying at the start of the second part would have left the first part with an unfulfilling end to nothing in particular, merely annoying the audience with a cliffhanger, and left the second part with an emotionally out of place beginning of the torture of one fan favourite character and the heartrending death of another. If anything, such events ending part one sets Harry up for somewhat of a vengeful motivation to get moving so quickly in part two. The reason why we extended the first film was because we wanted some emotional resolution. Yes, it was always going to be a bit of a cliffhanger, but what we also wanted and felt we needed was some emotional climax. And having Dobby die and then be buried provided that. If, it, if, we'd, if we'd cut the film the other way, um, we'd have seen him in one film and then we'd have seen him in another, and I don't think it would have been as moving and affecting as it is now. Oh, isn't that sad? I hope you're happy now. This was originally intended to be the end of, of Deathly Hallows Part 1. From Bellatrix's point of view, through the gates, um, what looks like uh, it could be Harry's scar, uh, and on a big cry of triumph, uh, everything would have gone to black, uh, and that would have been the end of the movie. Pause here for a bit. But it's not, uh, because we were lucky enough to film both of these films back to back. And so uh, it was a hugely long schedule, which was quite punishing. But the rewarding thing for us was that we had the luxurious position of being able to say, well, we could end it there, or we could end it here, or we could end it there. Uh, and ultimately, as you've just seen, we decided to end it somewhere else, because it just felt, it felt like a more complete movie. Part 2 and the final dozen chapters of the book move a lot faster than part 1, with everything from Gringotts onwards happening over the course of two days. The long dialogues of plot exposition Rowling has always been fond of relaying through Dumbledore may have been cut down to maintain this brisk pace the film's marketing promised to make a spectacle of, but with how little the preceding films clarified about their plots, it's not something the franchise is unaccustomed to. It does, as always, however, rely on the audience having read and remembered the details of the book to fill in the gaps chooses the wizard, Mr. Potter. Ron and Hermione are bewildered and impressed by Harry's urgency to question Ollivander about wands and to question Griphook about the sword, after which they formulate an insane plan around the idea that, although the sword in Bellatrix's vault is a fake, it may hold a real horcrux. I bet you anything there's a horcrux in there, another piece of his soul. Gringotts may be heralded as this impenetrable vault, and the goblins may be neutral in the war, but Voldy handing a horcrux over to one of his followers already didn't go down so well, and he should have been informed that the goblin Griphook escaped from Malfoy manner with the trio, and that his imprisonment could be an incentive to help them. Not that his help seems all that essential to how easily they managed to break into Gringotts. The trio's straightforward use of a Bellatrix Polyjuice Potion for Hermione, a Death Eater disguise for Ron, and an Invisibility Cloak piggyback ride for Harry and Griphook, going by with the mildest of hitches they easily remedy with an improvised Imperius curse. Griphook's consultation consists of letting them know the bankers are onto them, driving the minecart, and demonstrating how a conveniently placed box of clanking devices drives away the dragon defending the row of vaults they're aiming for, an unnecessarily cruel defence that can't be of any more use than a spell that only lets owners of a vault approach or open it. 
Inside Bellatrix's vault, the mountains of treasure don't just multiply, but burn enough to singe away parts of the trio's clothing, and after escaping Gringotts, the trio wins as they dab Essence of Dittany over their many burns. Despite no such burning being established in the film, they still seem to rub their hands with dabs of what may as well be hand sanitizer. Having found the Hufflepuff's cup Horcrux, aided like all the Horcruxes in the film by the high-pitched whistle indicative of their wickedness that I'm not sure if Harry senses with the audience, How do we know what it is when we get in there? Horcruxes can be anything. I'll... I'll know. How? I don't know how to explain it, but I'll know. They only escape to be able to heal their wounds, because the useless defence the dragon provided the vaults transferred to providing a precarious getaway ride, a decision the film of course decided to take away from Harry and give to Hermione. I've got something, but it's mad! In Voldy's goblin massacring realisation that his horcruxes are known about and being hunted, Harry looks in on his panic to fly and check each horcrux's location and double their protections. Now, the trio almost definitely know a horcrux lies in Hogwarts, and have until Voldy checks the locations of the other horcruxes to break in and find it. We've been hunting horcruxes. We think the last one's inside the castle. Unlike the book, Harry actually tells Aberforth they're hunting Horcruxes, and from here on doesn't bother keeping it a secret from anyone else who could help, as the secret is no longer necessary now that Volley knows what they're up to. There's something we need to find. Something hidden here in the castle. And it may help us defeat you know who. Dumbledore may have wanted to keep the vaguest possible info in the smallest possible pool of people to reduce the chance someone gets mind read or sells them out, but such secrecy is hard to justify when after everything it turns out nobody important got mind read. This secrecy is so ingrained in Harry in the book that even after entering Hogwarts through the portrait, meeting up with Dumbledore's army, and going to look for the diadem Horcrux in Ravenclaw Tower, he doesn't even tell McGonagall what their goal is at Hogwarts, other than to find something that might be Ravenclaw's diadem. It's especially jarring when on his way to sacrifice himself in the forest, Harry tells Neville to make sure Nagini dies, and only, in so doing, ensures Voddy's defeat. From coming to McGonagall's defence with the Cruciatus curse, Snape still acting villainous and getting kicked out of Hogwarts, and everyone fortifying for the battle, Harry idiotically finds himself baffled at the absence of Ron and Hermione, who have obviously gone to the chamber, and we see go to the chamber in the film. As Harry is about to enter the Room of Requirement, Ron and Hermione come running to join him with armfuls of basilisk fangs. Hermione praises Ron's brilliance, and Harry yells genius at the most obvious solution to their loss of the Sword of Gryffindor. However, it isn't the only solution for very long, as their Room of Requirement hunting gets interrupted by the confused allegiance of Draco and his two goons, and one of his two goons casts a spell known as Fiendfire. Fiendfire, as Hermione explains after they escape the exploding Room of Requirement, is the only spell known to be able to destroy Horcruxes. She didn't think to mention this until they saw the spell in action just now, because the idea of using something so uncontrollably destructive is preposterous. It might take the idiocy of someone like Crab to use it, but it doesn't help that he manages to cast something so powerful despite his idiocy, and despite Dumbledore as far as we know, never risking such a method of Horcrux destruction, instead choosing to destroy the ring with the sword he had easy access to. If Hermione knew about Fiendfire's effectiveness all along Long, she should have at least brought it up so they could spend some of their many hours of aimless camping thinking about a way to use it in a contained or escapable environment like a cave or island. Draco, Crab, and Goyle showing up to stop them at all feels like a now out of place callback to their silly old school rivalry with the trio, and so Harry can save Draco from burning alive so that Narcissa later lies about him being dead in the forest. Draco, is he alive? Dead. Nagini is the last Horcrux, and although they know Voldy is keeping her protected by his side, they make their way across the battlefield towards him, towards the Shrieking Shack in the book and the boathouse in the film, where Voldy finds himself troubled by the Elder One's loyalty. Uh, I am extraordinary, but the One resist me. When the trio reach Voldy, they're lucky enough to eavesdrop on his conversation with Snape unnoticed, and for Voldy to mortally wound Snape in such a way his death is delayed long enough for them to retrieve his memories. Harry learning the truth through those memories to in hindsight make Snape's death a more tragic one is the only real reason Snape dies by Voldy's hand at this moment at all. Voldy kills Snape, his right hand man, because he believes the Elder One's allegiance passes through killing, but I don't believe his arrogance would lead him to make a mistake that stupid when he knows 
Grindelwald remained alive throughout Dumbledore's possession of the Elder Wand. By his logic, this would mean Dumbledore was never the Wand's master, and so Snape couldn't have won it from him, and that if Grindelwald was ever the Wand's master, then Voldy has already won its allegiance after killing Grindelwald in his prison cell. Not that it goes down like that in the film, where instead of showing remorse for his crimes and mocking Voldy, Grindelwald tells him where the Elder Wand lies, and Voldy flies away without killing him in frustration. The film's tiptoeing around the contrived nonsense of Wand law may be deserved, but it's unfortunately integral enough to Voddy's defeat in the book to leave some noticeable blank spots in the film. Voddy also makes the baffling decision to kill Snape indirectly, weakening him with an attack before he can fight back, ordering Nagini to finish the job, and then leaving before the job is actually finished. Nagini may be an extension of him as a Horcrux, and the Elder One's allegiance may therefore still pass to him if it did pass through killing, but why risk such an indirect and inconclusive way of killing Snape, and why use anything other than the killing curse he's been so trigger happy with before. And as far as we know, the only reason Harry takes Voldy up on the offer to sacrifice himself is because he sees the truth, or at least Snape's version of the truth, in Snape's memories. Therefore, had the trio not been nearby to witness Snape's death, both Voldy and Dumbledore's plans would have been even less likely to work out than they already were. So when the time comes, the boy must die. Whilst the story tries to redeem Snape more than these memories suggest he's deserving of, the chapter is famous for a reason, recontextualising the past seven years of his weird treatment of Harry and his weird relationship with Dumbledore. Hide her. Hide them all. I beg you. What will you give me in exchange, Severus? The plot twist that Snape really was loyal to Dumbledore is majorly soured by the irredeemable extent of his bullying and by us never really questioning the source of the red herring nature of his villainy because he has all along been the face of the villain club known as Slytherin. Such decisions as asking Harry to be expelled at the start of Chamber, despite knowing he would be vulnerable if he were, suggest Rowling didn't have the extent of his character motivation, that being his love for Lily, as thoroughly planned out as she claims. On the other hand, his particular abuse of Neville makes all the more sense when if Voddy pursued Neville as the chosen one before Harry, Lily might not have died. Albeit, Snape asking Voddy to spare Lily, a request it is uncharacteristic for Voddy to care about, enables Lily to cast the sacrificial magic that saves Harry and goes on to play a major part in Voddy's defeat. Thinking how obedient he is to fulfil Dumbledore's fortuitously elegant plan, Harry exits the pensieve and makes his way to the forest. Whilst in the book he dons the invisibility cloak and walks past everyone except Neville, knowing they would try to stop him and lying to Neville so he doesn't, the film couldn't resist sneaking in a little bit more spoon-feeding exposition in a final goodbye between the trio. There's a reason I can hear them. The Horcruxes. Now that Harry is on his way to die, the snitch he's been carrying around since the burrow has met the criteria Dumbledore set for it to be openable, and from the resurrection stone he, I guess, subconsciously calls on Lily, James, Sirius and Lupin to give him the final push. Snape and Dumbledore don't appear because he's surely too conflicted about whatever love for them it's strange for him to gain enough of within the 19 year time skip to name his kids in their honour. Also, it would be weird for Dumbledore to appear both in the forest and in Limbo, where the reality of them actually conversing in Limbo makes more sense than it all being a figment of Harry's imagination, because Dumbledore confirms some things Harry seems none the wiser about, and doesn't come to a very particular conclusion about the Elder Wand that Harry later does come to in his final duel against Voldy. The film of course barely tries to clarify anything before Dumbledore ghosts Harry, but doing so when they've barely set up the things to be clarified would have been even more contrived than it already is in the book. Harry survives what is in the film Voldy's transitionary explosion of a killing curse because, as Dumbledore explains, Voldy used Harry's blood to remake his body at the end of Goblet of Fire. The twinkle in Dumbledore's expression after he found out about this at the end of Goblet is the tiniest proof Rowling had this idea planned out as far back as then, but that doesn't stop the magical explanation as to why it has ensured Harry's survival from feeling like an enormously convenient arse pull. Dumbledore states, He took your blood and rebuilt his living body with it. Your blood in his veins, Harry. Lily's protection inside both of you. He tethered you to life while he lives. He took your blood, believing it would strengthen 
strengthen him. He took into his body a tiny part of the enchantment your mother laid upon you when she died for you. His body keeps her sacrifice alive, and while that enchantment survives, so do you, and so does Voldemort's one last hope for himself. It's impressive that for a series with such abstract and arbitrary magic inhabiting its every corner, the explanation for Harry's survival still breaks the suspension of disbelief. That his blood existing inside Voldy inexplicably extends Lily's protection past his coming of age, and has therefore turned Voldy into a pseudo-Horcrux tethering him to life. Dumbledore's certainty that this legendarily unique combo of love sacrifice magic and blood magic is the reason for Harry's survival also denies the mystery of what part the Hallows might have played, their mythology suggesting the one to unite the Hallows will become master of death. Rowling denies this mystery and creates the contrivance of Dumbledore's omniscience because she doesn't want the one to own all three Hallows or unite them in the same place to be a literal master of death who can, for instance, control when and when not to die. Instead, she wants Harry to be worthy of owning all three Hallows because of his acceptance of the inevitability of death. The death of Joanne Rowling's mother was to have a profound effect on her writing. In many ways, the whole of Harry Potter is one giant attempt to reclaim a childhood. I'd been writing for six months before she died. The weird thing is, the essential plot didn't change after my mother died, but everything deepened and darkened. Harry was always going to lose his parents, and it was always going to be a quest, really, to um, to avenge them, but to avenge everyone against this, this creature, this being who believes that he can make himself immortal by killing other people. So that's, a, that, that's something I created before she died, but yes, it seeped into every part of the books. I think, in retrospect, now I've finished, I see just how much it informed everything. Well, Neville, I'm sure we'd all be fascinated to hear what you have to say. Neville stands up to Voldy in front of everyone. In the book, pulling the sword from the hat and dealing a one-hit kill to Nagini after Voldy decided to lift her protective cage from before the start of the battle, and in the film, saving Ron and Hermione from Nagini's freely slithering jaws at the end of the battle. More importantly, Harry turns out not to be dead after all, disappearing under his cloak in the confused chaos of the commencing battle in the book, and clumsily rolling out of Hagrid's arms and running off in plain sight in the film. <laughs> The good guys go in full retreat back into the Great Hall. The battle for Hogwarts is really a backdrop uh, to um, that fight that takes place between Harry and, and Voldemort. The shooting of the final confrontation between Voldemort and, and, and Harry was took quite some time. There are many different bits, and it was quite carefully orchestrated. In the book, the standoff between Harry and Voldemort happens in the Great Hall. And it happens with lots of teachers and pupils watching. And it works beautifully in the book, but in the movie, I wanted a, more of a fight between those two. So it, we extended their battle. So it was more of a finale. Um, so we have them racing through the school and dueling with each other. We actually get to a point where I'm actually up close and I'm actually got him by the throat and hitting him or kicking him. So it's very physical. Something we've been building to throughout the series is, is, is the conflict between Harry and, and, and Voldemort. And finally, in this film, we're going go, to we're gonna see them going at it. <laughs> Harry knows Voldemort is terrified of dying. So he just grabs Voldemort by the neck and he says, Come on, Tom. Let's finish this the way we started it. Together. We had some great fun with Rafe and Dan on wires upside down, side to side, fighting. And they really went at it. Daniel was so intense that morning, and Rafe really, really, really responded to it. And they were scrabbling, and they were pulling at each other. It wasn't particularly pleasant for them, but we did about three or four takes, and it was a really intense moment. <laughs> Completely covered in filth and dust, and I'm and I, my face is bleeding from where Harry's hit me. And 
It's a massive moment for both Harry and for Voldemort. And it's their final duel together. They've fought many times before. And this is, this is the final encounter. In the film, Voldy takes his sweet time chasing Harry around the castle's few disconnected set pieces in a manner too obnoxious for me to bother describing, especially with the book's added knowledge that Harry is effectively immortal so long as Voldy lives, removing what little danger Harry himself is actually in. The book doesn't so desperately try to pretend like the magical combat has been able to carry a scene at any point throughout the series. This is because an obligatory cinematic showdown between Harry and Voldy doesn't take the centre of any kind of action-oriented stage. The separate fights of Ron and Hermione seemingly giving up against Nagini and Molly out of nowhere beating Bellatrix are instead condensed into one long fight everyone has together, and everyone includes the shopkeepers and homeowners of Hogsmeade, families and friends of the students and teachers of Hogwarts, house elves, and all other manner of what Rowling has deemed good magical creatures joining an eruption so chaotic that nobody, despite Hagrid's shouts of where's Harry, knows Harry actually isn't dead. That they're engaging in this last stand is all the more significant when they're doing it regardless of, or perhaps in fury of, Harry being dead. A huge contrast to the hopelessness with which everyone stood in defeat until Harry tumbled out of Hagrid's arms in the film. From under the cloak, it should by now be evident he should really have used in combat more often, Harry moves through the chaos shooting at any Death Eaters he can see, until, to everyone's confusement, blocking Voldy from killing Molly, and to all but the Death Eaters' cheers, pulling off the cloak to reveal himself. The exposition he proceeds to dump on Evron after insisting they don't interfere as he and Voldy circle each other is a clumsy and flagrant reversal of the villain explaining every detail of their plan before enacting it trope. But it is necessary to ensure everyone present, including Voldy, understands the finality of Voldy's death and Harry's innocence in causing that death. That Harry's sacrifice in the forest created the same protection for his Hogwarts allies as Lily's did for him, and that only Dumbledore figured out or even knew about such magic despite love and sacrifice surely occurring between wizards other than Harry and Lily, is the least of the magic system's issues in comparison to the influence one law has on Voldy's death. Because whilst love and a sacrifice made with love can be excused as an unexplainable ancient phenomenon, ones have from the beginning been the most pervasive of magical tools. Harry says Dumbledore intended for the Elder Wand's allegiance to die with him when Snape killed him, because the Elder Wand passes not through killing, but through some arbitrary opinion it has about who is worthy of it. Except who is worthy is by all accounts not arbitrary, specifically when it comes to disarming, meaning that when Draco made it up the Astronomy Tower before Snape and disarmed Dumbledore, the Elder Wand most capriciously decided that Draco Malfoy, not the genius who had wielded it for half a century, was more worthy of its allegiance. If Voldy wanted to gain that allegiance, he need only only have disarmed Draco, and apparently not even disarmed the Elder Wand itself from Draco. As Harry comes to the conclusion that despite him never touching the Elder Wand, he has had its allegiance since disarming Draco's wand during the events at Malfoy Manor, not by magic, but by physically snatching it from his hands. That the Elder Wand sensed this from where it lay with Dumbledore's corpse, and switched allegiance despite having nothing to do with Harry disarming Draco, and Harry not even using magic to do the disarming, is the most deplorable contrivance in the series. Oh. All the chopping and changing with wands in the last book. I, 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 we are I so. I can explain it to you, Dan. Can <laughs> you please? We are so struggling on this set. I have to say, I will get my audio. And who's this? Who's this? This is Draco's mum's. Who who's does this really belong to? It's it's and it's because we got and, and and then trying to explain it then to Rafe when Rafe comes on as Voldemort and I'm kind of looking at him in his Voldemort makeup and he's asking me about the ones that I'm completely panicking going I've really got to find the most succinct way I can explain this to you in two minutes but I don't know if that's possible. Add to that the unexpected degree of idiocy with which Voldy acted outside of Dumbledore's plans in concluding the Elder Wand passes through killing rather than the equally idiotic conclusion that it can pass through such fickle means as it did from Draco to Harry that just so happens to be the truth and we have a scenario where Voldy dies and is defeated not as a result of his philosophy, but a magical technicality so obscure, even a master wand maker didn't know about it, that Harry was unbelievably lucky to have fallen into and uncharacteristic to have had an independent epiphany about. A possibility that should be equally on the table, by which I mean Harry's explanation is just a guess that so happens to line up with the final result, is that the Elder Wand doesn't work to its full potential for Voldy and chooses not to enact his will to kill Harry, because of the two duelists, Harry is either the figurative or literal master 
disaster of death, the former of which better slots in as a resolution of the theme of accepting death Rowling has written Harry to reside on the correct side of. In other words, the Elder One should simply have refused to kill Harry after his sacrifice in the forest because it has accepted him. Nonsensical mechanics of one's changing allegiance through disarming is unnecessary. The manner of Voldy's death, a golden flame colliding between them and the Elder One flying out of his hand and the spell it was casting hitting him on its way towards Harry, can occur in all of its ridiculousness all the same. The only saving grace in this mess is that ordinary ones aren't so fickle as the Elder Ones. Their choosing of the wizard inexplicably nuanced enough for none of the millions of disarmings that must have occurred throughout wizarding history to have rendered everyone with ineffective ones. By the way, going back to the first day we met, this was this was the moment that stunned me. I remember you um, you saying, you know, you said, I know the movies can't be the books. And I said, really? And you go, you go, it, I know what's coming. And she says, you're not going to be able to do it. Because you, <laughs> you were you were really sort of doing Goblet of Fire at that point. Yeah. And you said, it's not going to be possible without the movies being eight hours long. And I thought it was so, again, so prescient. And I you forgot, said, I forgot I said that. And then you said something very specific. You said, look, all I ask is that you be true to the characters. Yeah, yeah. And I said, remember you, saying that, yeah. And yeah, I think the thing, what happened for me was, and it was not anything that you did, it's what the world did, which was that what happened was what brilliant text became sacred text and yeah. and and i think which is not an easy position to be in no because alistair was gone and, and for the most part the broken soldiers were gone and and it also was because when chris came in and i understand chris wanted to have great fidelity to the text and and, and it came out of enthusiasm um but it was harder than to improvise and it, i'm not saying that was the wrong decision i'm just saying that i think by the time that alfonso came along we had to had, yeah we had to change a little bit because as we, time we went on people it. had more confidence I think that, that as the series went on, though, I think that you were given a more latitude to improvise, as yeah. you say, and I think that was great for the films. Well, you would always um, encourage it, though. You well, would always say... Well, I did. This is the irony. Everyone always assumes I would say, don't change a yeah. word! But actually, going through the reverse, I used to say, yeah, change it. Well, I, I was saying before we started this that, to someone that, that um, either people think you were standing there like a taskmaster or that you weren't involved at all. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, you, you were always I my greatest. I could have in and out like a ghost. Well, I, I could have used you even more, but you were always just my greatest ally. Magic obfuscating the story is something book readers are certainly more familiar with, given the not unreasonable decision to feign ignorance the films have left film-only watchers to pick up the scraps with. Out of all the entries, Deathly Hallows stands out as a particularly egregious offence on magic systems, because instead of tying a neat bow on a seven-year-long mystery, it comes across as tangling seven years of magical convolutions into one disparate mass of contrived knots to meet a predetermined ending. As some say, it may be the case that what magic cannot do is more interesting and holds more potential for enthralling drama than what magic can do. Poorly educated categories of magic our characters spend years taking school lessons for, there may be, Harry Potter still features little to no predictably consistent rules or restrictions to inform its drama. Just a vague visual and auditory aesthetic of how the reality warping powers everyone is equipped to invent and replicate manifest in the world, the consistency of which is itself only locked down by the cinematic viable style the films had to establish. The few times restrictions do creep their way in, drama and consequence, however short-lived and forgotten, come along with it. It's no coincidence that the best entry in the series contains the most consistent or hard piece of magic. Instead of getting in the way, the Patronus actively supports the thematic journey Harry goes on and the drama he experiences throughout Prisoner, because it abides by its rules and fulfills our expectations of what Harry needs to conjure the spell and what effect it has on the specific time of enemy it was invented to combat. The only universal rule there's evidence to make my own headcanon for is that speed is the determining factor in who should win a duel, since wizards don't walk around with passive protections and can just as easily be shot in the head with a gun as shot with a harmful spell if they don't react in time. Likewise, every wizard has a limit to how many assailants they can single-handedly defend against the individual spells of. I was going to dedicate a larger segment to dissecting Harry Potter's magic, but when the nuisance of unexplained magic or magic that breaks its own rules is proportional to how much it's used to solve the story's problems, and Rowling uses magic to solve near enough every one of the story's problems, the succinct conclusion I can't help having grown only more confident in is that Rowling's arbitrary approach to her system is such a detriment to the story she bends it in all manner of directions to fit, that it isn't worthy of being at the centre of such a discussion. It was five years from the train journey where I had the original idea 
to finishing the book. And during those five years, this mass of material was generated, some of which will never find its way into the book, will never need to be in the books. It's, it's just stuff I need to know for my own pleasure, partly for my own pleasure and partly because I like reading a book where I have the sense that the author knows everything. They might not be telling me everything, but you have that confidence that the author really knows everything. OK, so this is, um, to the untrained eye, might look like a pile of waste paper, but um, <laughs> this is 10 years' work. As you can see, I file meticulously, and I know where every single piece of paper is. <coughs> but I've dragged out a few bits and pieces. As Voddy's debacle with the Elder One comes to an end and he slumps dead to the ground, the surrounding audience explodes in celebration. Learning exactly how he lost before dying surrounded by his enemies is one thing, but that he kills over with such unceremonious humanity and his body remains as proof of the finality of this demise is crucial for Wizarding Britain to accept the end of his reign of terror. The Chosen One bringing forth the sunshine in his triumph and the word he did so with the power of love no doubt spreading in the coming weeks will just further catapult about Harry to a status of unfathomable legend. On the other hand, the film makes one final baffling departure from the book by staging Harry and Voddy's duel in the deserted courtyard, where nobody is witness to Harry's triumph and Voddy leaves behind no proof of his demise as he disintegrates across the wind, after which it seems Harry stood up and wobbled over to the Great Hall to find everyone already chatting over cups of tea and barely paying him any attention. Rowling writes, McGonagall had replaced the house tables, but nobody was sitting according to house anymore. All were jumbled together, teachers and pupils, ghosts and parents, centaurs and house elves, etc. Even the Malfoys sit in peace, as opposed to reuniting with Draco and abandoning the last stand in the film. I can't say such self-preservation is out of character, but it does kind of defeat the obligatory anti-discrimination point Rowling seems impatient to breeze over. In fact, she seems on the whole uninterested to linger after Voddy's death, as Harry finds Ron and Hermione sitting together and asks them to follow him. They leave the hall and go up to the headmaster's office, where amongst an ovation from the portraits, tears are sliding down portrait Dumbledore's face, continuing to diminish the impacts of Dumbledore's death or any death in this world. But at last put to rest as Rowling's narrative crutch, portrait Dumbledore agrees with Harry's decision for how to deal with the Hallows. He'll keep the cloak and pass it on when he dies. He won't go looking for the stone he deliberately dropped in the forest. And after repairing his otherwise irreparable original wand with the the Elder Wand, he'll put it back in Dumbledore's grave. Although he doesn't repair his original wand in the film, his decision to snap the Elder Wand and chuck it into the ravine actually makes more sense than this decision to leave it and the stone in two famous and easily searchable places. The stone may cause an obsession with or longing for death, but in terms of the other magic that exists, it's a relatively harmless connection to dead loved ones more than a few wizards would be desperate to get their hands on. The Elder Wand, on the other hand, Harry has recently confirmed the existence and mechanics of to the world, igniting the desires of a lifetime of power-hungry wizards, Harry will risk being disarmed by at every corner. What should we do with it? We? Just saying, that's the Elder One. But the mystery won't finally unfold until Book 7. J.K. Rowling has already written the ending. Well, this is the thing that I was very dubious about showing you. And I don't really know why, because what does this give away? But this is the final chapter of book seven, um, which I'm still dubious about showing you. I don't know what I feel like the camera's going to be able to see through the folder. So this is it, and I'm not opening it for obvious reasons. This is, this is really where I wrap everything up. It's the epilogue, and I, I basically say what, what happens to everyone after they leave school, those who survive, because there are deaths, more deaths coming. It was a way of just saying to myself, well, you will get here, you will get to book seven one day, and then you'll need this. Yeah, I think I've finished. Hey, Joe, well done. Thank you. Well, you don't know, it might be rubbish. Thanks. Some people will loathe it. They're absolutely loathe it. But the thing is, yeah, that's as it should be, because for some people to love it, others must loathe it. That's just in the nature of the, of the, of the plot. Some people won't be happy because of what they wanted to happen hasn't happened. And to an extent, there's so much expectation from the, the hardcore fans that I'm not sure I could ever match up to it, but... Um, 
I'm re well, I'm actually really, really happy with it. So it's very odd to think that this will be broadcast after loads of people have read it. And people may right now be throwing things at the screen, but I am I'm really happy with it. I like it. And I don't always feel like that. Joe puts on the page numbers and saves the document. Rolling left herself a lot of room to posthumously make up new details about the post Voldemort Wizarding World because the epilogue that ends this series is set a whole 19 years later and all it confirms is that the world is peaceful enough for the trio's generation of children to be sent off to Hogwarts. This is meant to be cathartic but the huge blank space of how the Wizarding World has changed we're left with and how fanservice Rowling's attempts to suggest things have changed are too distracting for it to land. Albus Severus Potter if anything, it detracts from the reader's option to think for themselves where the trio end up after all the trauma and how wizarding society fixed the things that caused the war in the first place. I'm talking about the end of seven, the epilogue. I, the epilogue changed when because what because some people really I like the epilogue, it, but some people had a problem with it. Some people hate it. Yeah, a version of it what was literally written 17 years previously to the book. A version yeah. of it was written, but as I said to you earlier, you know some people were in there who didn't turn up in the final cut and so on. Um, Yes, I didn't, I wanted to give a snapshot. I think what a lot of people felt about the tone of the epilogue was, so this is it, so it's over, so he's not a hero anymore, he's a sort of middle-aged man seeing his, ch it, it felt like a letdown, but you, I have said this before, for me, absolute heroism is rebuilding after that kind of trauma. Yeah. And I could think of nothing more noble than that he's, He's acting what Dumbledore preached but didn't live. You see, Dumbledore preached, these are the values that see us through, that survive, love, and yeah. those sort of human bonds. Harry's actually living it. So he was always the guy to me who had it thrust upon him. He, yeah. And that was supposed to be epitomized to go back to the wands in the fact that he had the chance to have his finger on the nuclear button, as it were. He had the chance to own this, this most powerful one. And he said, no, nope, want, want, want that one, want that yeah. one. I want my own and yeah. I want to break the, the chain. I'm just wild about Harry, and Harry's wild about me. The heavenly princess of his kids is guilty for that. So far, nothing can cloud J.K. Rowling's success, and the long awaited Harry Potter movie achieved the biggest opening weekend in film history. The closer the viewing came, the more frightened I became to the point where, where I actually sat down to watch the film, I was terrified. Because I, I just thought, oh, please don't do anything that's not in the book. Please don't take horrible liberties with the plot. I liked it, which was a relief, as you can imagine. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy. Don't, 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 oh, no, it can't be. <laughs> it can't be. No, I, don't, I, I think it would, you've got, no, I think it's definitely time to stop, time to stop now. It gives me a certain satisfaction to say what I thought happened and to, and to tell other people that because, um, because I would like my version to be the official version still, even though I've not written it in a book, because it's my world. What, what, what's wrong? What's wrong? You know, and I, I say, I just can't go there anymore. I can't go there anymore. And it, you know, it had been a place I could escape to for 17 years. And I, and I knew the door had closed. Oh. And it was, um, yeah. But you know what happens ever after. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I couldn't stop. I don't think you can when you've been that involved with characters for mm -hmm. that long. It's still all in there. They're all in my head still. I mean, I could write, I, I could, I could definitely write an eighth, ninth, ten. I could, easily. You could. Will yeah. you? I'm not going to say I won't. Mm -hmm. I don't think I will. I loved writing those books. I loved writing it. So I feel I am done, but you never know. I don't honestly feel like I ever left. I'm never going to leave. I'm never going to leave. It was 17 years of my life. I was quite heartbroken to finish writing. It was tough, very tough. Going back is so easy. It's ridiculously easy for me. I feel like I'm just unlocking a door back into my own house. And I love that. I love having the ongoing contact. So pulling things out of boxes or inventing a little bit more for Pottermore is just fun.
and it's a wonderful way to stay connected to the world and to fans of Harry, so that's all great. Harry Potter is unsurprisingly mediocre for something so popular. At best, an accessible introduction to more interesting and challenging media. At worst, a trap of nostalgic stagnation. There's passion and creativity and potential around most corners, but so is a lingering staleness. I don't believe Rowling intended to, or is even capable of having manufactured Harry Potter into the phenomenon it became. What she wanted to write just so happened to contain the right derivative combination at the right time to blow up. I can however believe she felt pressured to expand the story beyond her capabilities in order to meet the expectations resulting from that blow up, and the films bringing it to such high budget cinematic light added yet more fuel to an already roaring fire. Most authors' popular works don't stay nearly as relevant in pop culture as hers has, and I therefore don't envy how much she clearly looks back on things she wants to change, but things like Fantastic Beasts and the distant HBO adaptation aren't going to do her any favours in that regard. What a fresh Harry Potter adaptation needs, and the different format of a multi-season TV series is the best opportunity for, is a showrunner with ideas that improve on the source material and are better than whatever garbled nonsense Rowling will conjure up if given the chance. Unfortunately for such a famous story everybody already knows the plot beats of, and around which Rowling keeps her grip tight, that possibility is further out of reach than it has been for any remake pretty much ever, comparable only to the dilemmas a remake of Lord of the Rings would Garner. As innocently or not, Rowling formed a derivative patchwork of the only fantasy mountain large enough to at least partially escape the shadow cast by Tolkien's. The book is embargoed until one second past midnight. At that point, J.K. Rowling will open Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows and begin to read. Countdown takes place worldwide. Chapter One The Dark Lord Ascending. Coming up, Joe's decision to sever ties with her father. I have my raisins. Any you want to share? Shoes. Yeah, I've helpfully made the note for myself. This will need very serious planning. <laughs> I don't know when I wrote that. Thank you very much. In the first 24 hours, 2.65 million books are bought in the United Kingdom and 8.3 million books are sold in the United States. That's over 7,000 copies a minute. Now, Joe Rowling is writing again. 